All right. Hello, Julie. Thanks so much for joining me. How are you doing today? I'm fine, Chris. And what a pleasure it is to finally get to meet you. Yeah, oh, yeah, Ab absolutely. So funny story for people who, you know, don't know. But anyways, I just randomly stumbled across your work like a few weeks ago. Saw you had a book coming out. I'm like, hey, I want to read that book. And we connected and you sent me an early copy and everything like that. So your book is Feminism for Women. You have been uh, doing this and writing and talking about this for years now. So this isn't, you know, the first thing you've written. So what, what kind of inspired this particular book? And for those who have yet to read it, what's, what's the main focus? Well, I called it Feminism for Women because in the past decade or so, we've increasingly been moving towards what passes for feminism as something that tends to benefit privileged so-called progressive men mm. and it, it's kind of we're in an Orwellian situation I know that that term is overused but <laughs> I really think it's appropriate right now that everything that's actually bad for women has been repackaged and sold back to us as empowering and choice and free choice and liberating and actually it's anything but so you can take examples such as the sex trade the global sex trade that is a cause and a consequence of women's oppression that, mm -hmm. that that focuses its energy on the abuse of marginalized women and girls such as care leavers indigenous and native women women of color black women women who have been sexually groomed and exploited mm -hmm. um, into feeling like they're worthless preyed upon by by men for profit and one-sided sexual pleasure. And all of a sudden it's repackaged as sex work and it's, it's twin sister stripping and lap dancing mm -hmm. is seen as something that's really great for exercise. I mean, actually I was watching a film recently um, where one of the main characters, the, there were two guys talking about um, whether or not the sex wars were still raging or whether they've been won. Mm -hmm. And one of the characters said, and I'm sure your listeners can work out which one it is by a quick mm -hmm. Google. Listen, you know, we've won the sex wars. Men have won the sex wars. We won as soon as women started pole dancing for exercise. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, I think it was Ryan Gosling. Anyway, the point is that things such as even religious fundamentalism so women who are Muslim born, who are now secularists, who campaign against Sharia law, campaign against the abuse um, meted out to women and girls who live in all fundamentalist religious communities, mm -hmm. you know, have found that for some liberal white men on the left, they seem to be apologists for Islamic fundamentalism all of a sudden, because of course our enemy's enemy is our friend. Mm -hmm. And women are the collateral damage, women are the cannon fodder. And so a long answer to your short question, mm -hmm. I wanted to write this book because at the moment, feminism seems to have forgotten that it should be centering women and girls globally and not actually be prioritizing everything but the struggle for emancipation and liberation of women and girls yeah. um, above everything. So, so so let me ask you that. So, you know, the subtitle of the book is the the real route to liberation. So when you when you talk about liberation of women, like what does that look like to you? Well, feminism is an extremely optimistic movement. We have to be because it's we've got a big job on our hands. Uh, you know, we have to convince half of the planet uh, to relinquish their power and to treat us as equals. But we're also optimistic because we know fine well that baby boys are not born programmed to harm or abuse and depress us. And nor are baby girls born to be victims and to be subservient. Mm. So therefore, there are many men who are raised well with, you know, good parents and role models and peers that don't encourage them to take out their shit on women or to sexually exploit us. Mm -hmm. And also to encourage men to actually get in touch with their feelings, not just the angry ones, but the, <laughs> yeah. you know, the, the whole gamut. And so we know that there are, um, there are so many good men, but there's also a sizable, and I mean sizable minority of those that do harm and abuse women directly. And I'm afraid 
a majority that are bystanders that stand around thinking, well, it's not my problem. Well, it is your problem, men. It is. And that's why I work with men all over the world who are doing anti-sexist um, allyship amongst uh, themselves and also directly with women. So, so what, what I suppose the book means, what I mean by liberation is that the one thing that unites women and girls everywhere, and I would argue it's the only thing that unites women and girls everywhere, mm -hmm. is the fear and reality of male violence. So <clears throat> look, I mean, not every woman has been raped, but every woman has feared being raped and every woman curtails her freedom to an extent so that she isn't raped. And every woman worries about if she is raped, will she be blamed for it? Will she be believed? Might it happen again? All of that. Um, so liberation has to be an end to male violence. Mm -hmm. Because without that, if you see women in Norway and other Scandinavian countries, for example, or women at the top of the tree earning a million dollars on a really good salary, but complaining that she earns 10% less than her male counterpart, usually, you know, white US um, women who talk about the glass ceiling and do what we call lean in feminism, that is more concerned yeah. with the elite, you know, the 5% elite or whatever. So if we if we think about what those women have in common, there really isn't anything else except for the curtailment of our freedoms and citizenship, the effect on our mental and physical health um, of male violence. And if you actually say to women, women who are, for example, street cleaners um, in Mumbai or the woman that we've just described in the the the. the merchant bank who's earning a fortune she will have a similar experience mm. psychically i suppose to her sister in a very different kind of setting and so what i want the book to do is to forge solidarity between women in order that we can meet together to fight male violence because mm. there is a need to do so we don't have to pretend that we're all the same but we have to have an end vision of a mm. world without rape without prostitution without child sexual abuse without pornography without the everyday harassment of women that is so commonplace and we have yeah. to imagine that world or what the hell are we fighting for yeah, no, very well put. And and yeah, I, I love the book and you, you cover so many different topics. And and in a little bit, I do want to talk about the sex work thing, because I don't even know if I mentioned this to you, but I live in Las Vegas, Nevada. Right? right. So I've I've grown up here. So I, I have some questions because I know a lot of people. And actually, since reading your book, I've talked with a lot of people who I know here in Vegas. And and even though they work in the industry, in the industry, they're responsive. Uh, their responses have been very interesting, but we'll touch on that in a minute. Like uh, a lot of the book is talking about, like, like you mentioned the, uh, the like unifying around this, this issue with like male violence. So first thing I'll, I'll say this publicly on my podcast. One of the, one of the weird parts about being a guy and having these conversations is like with what I'm about to say, like there's this weird judgment from other guys like, oh, you're just, you're being this or whatever. But anyways, so I grew up, um, you know, uh, like, like all men, I have a mother, right? So like I've grown up in a family, uh, you know, uh, like of, uh, you know, feminists and everything. Like my mom, like she worked her ass off. She got a PhD. She overcome alcoholism. She helped me overcome it. Like my mom is a badass, right? But <laughs> too, uh, you know, um, many of my friends have been women and it wasn't until probably my early twenties where I realized that like, I, I, I wish I was exaggerating. Like 90% of the women I know have been a victim of some sort of sexual violence right and that's not even including physical violence of just like domestic abuse and things like that and right. I, I sat there as i you know when i when i heard it from a few of my female friends then i started asking more and i was literally like what the fuck is going on right, right. like i didn't know and then something that makes me feel like an ass is there's that saying like you know um this many women have been victims of you know rape or sexual assault but no men know some uh, another man who has you know perpetrated i'm like okay yeah. what's going on like you know uh based on just like numbers i must know somebody but you know so anyways 
one of the reasons, you know, I really wanted to talk with you is because there is a lot of talk about like, you know, men and like allyship and what men can do and all that. And, uh, you know, I've, I've actually listened to some of your interviews. Like I listened to your interview with uh, Andrew Doyle recently and stuff. So before I get to myself, one of the main reasons I've been reading so many books on feminism and all the different views and everything is because I'm the father of a 12 year old son. And my, my son, he's great. He's sweet. He's nice. I I'm blown away at how many people compliment how good he is, but I want to make sure he stays on that path. Right. So my long way of asking you, like when it comes to male allyship or whatever, like as a father to this young boy, like, because like you said, they're not born this way. What are, what are some things that as fathers teaching our sons that we can do to help you know what i mean do you know i'm <clears throat> i'm really glad that you've asked me this question chris because often men you're doing the opposite of this often men will get sentimental and say i have a daughter and i don't want her to go through this and i mm. want the world to be better for her and i want to say to them okay two things first of all why didn't you give a fuck before you had the daughter right, <laughs> right. <laughs> why is it only how many women have you fucked over before you have this daughter so think about that yeah. And I do believe in redemption. So let's get that out of the way. But think about that. And why is it just because it's your property that you are now concerned about it? What you're saying is that actually the hard work of raising boys needs to be really, it needs to be a political act. It needs to be something that isn't just done on your own for father to son, but to actually look around your your son's world and see how much peer pressure there is mm. on him and also how much commercial crap he gets thrown at himself all the time through if he has a cell phone or just you know at the movies and stuff that's hitting him over the head all the time you know buy this you need this use that yeah. the world is safer when it's virtual and that can lead him down the rabbit hole to pornographic images and stuff and so i i think that boys need to really have um the opportunity to hang out with other boys that aren't being bullied into sending dick pics to girls that yeah. aren't being pressured to download that porn that actually can develop into whole human beings without feeling shy or worried about asking about sex yeah. that we think yeah. about how sex education should be positive and we should be telling our boys and girls that sex is if you choose to have sex in a consensual safe setting it's great right it's because we love sex that we hate pornography that we think that the sex trade is built on the you know inhumanity of its victims that men become schooled into almost sociopathy by being trained into a kind of one-sided sexual contact scenario where it doesn't matter that this person that you're having sex with for your own pleasure doesn't respond or doesn't want to be there. Mm -hmm. And so I think, to be honest, for, especially for 12 year old boys, I think it all pretty much comes down to sex education and to positive roles with not just role models who are adults, because we know, we probably remember being 12. We didn't want adults telling us what to do all the time. Yeah. Well, we needed other 12 year olds around us. And clearly that includes girls, girls who've been raised by strong parents, by mm. feminists, by pro-feminist men, and seek out these, these um, positive friendships for the kids. And not just looking at it as the whole weight of this is on your shoulder. Because th there must be so many other parents that are worried about their kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They don't know what to do. Yeah, no, and absolutely. That, that point you made of, about daughters, like I think back when, when uh, my, my son's mom, when we were still together and she got pregnant, like I was like, oh my God, if I have this daughter, you know, but I, I started thinking about these things. But so I would love your, your opinion on, on this. Like I, I recently talked with uh, another author named uh, M Melinda Winter-Moyer and she has a book called How to Raise Kids Who Aren't Assholes. It's a great book. But anyways, <laughs> uh, uh, so I, so here's where I want your opinion. So I, I want to instill certain values in my son, right? And, and it's like, you know, be kind, be respectful, you know, ask, you know, ask permission and things like that, right? Like consent all across the board. Like when he was five, don't take somebody's toys. And, you right. know, like, I want all of these like respectful, just my, 
here's the parenting philosophy I've always had. I don't care how my son turns out. I don't care if he has, you know, if he's gay or has a different political ideology than I do or anything else. As long as he's not an asshole, I don't care, right? right. So anyways, my question for you is, do you think that's enough, right? If I set, if I try to set this foundation for this young man of be kind, be respectful, treat people, you know, the golden rule, treat people how you want to be treated and all of these other things. Do you think like that's enough? And we, we have been having those awkward sex conversations since he's 12, you know, and stuff like that. So I know sure. there's a little bit more, but do you think that's a good foundation or does there need to be more when it comes to teaching our young men? Yes and no. Of course, it's, <laughs> of course, it's a good foundation. Of course, that's the starting point. Without that, what do you have? It's a, it's a basic human value, isn't it, that I think has become eroded and, and replaced with something which is a kind of uber capitalistic, neoliberal dog eat dog, as long oh, as yeah. I'm okay, I don't care, you know. And of course, kids also get affected by that. But it's not enough in, in one sense. And this isn't your uh, fault it's just your responsibility and problem that's that's the unreassuring thing <laughs> but consent consent is great when we talk about toys and when we talk about sitting in somebody else's seat that's just gone to the restroom and mm -hmm. you know just those basic good manners but consent I would love to do away with the word consent when it comes to sex mm. because if you ask me you know, we meet in Starbucks, you ask me to, to loan you $10. I might consent to doing that. But we, we understand that the word consent is grudging. It's kind of a bit grudging. So I might consent to going out to dinner at the restaurant I didn't want to go to, but my partner did, right? Mm. So, okay, I'll consent to that. We can't talk about sex in this way. It has to be it has to be enthusiastic participation. Whether or not, and clearly I'm not talking about a 12-year-old here, but I'm talking about sex yeah. Um, amongst adults and the way we understand it whether or not you meet someone in the back room of a sex bar and you don't even know their name whether or not you go out on a date that you've you've hooked up you know through grinder or through some other dating app or whether you meet someone at a dinner party and fall madly in love with them there and then right consent has to be a word that we really start to do away with because the power is always in heterosexual sexual liaisons the power is with the man whether or not he chooses to use that mm. and many men choose not to use that and actually work very hard at shedding those assumptions and that sense of entitlement that men are raised to have but really consent i don't want to consent to sex i want to really want it yeah. so so that's a conversation that how would a 12 year old get to grips with that? Well, I suppose, you know, looking at the kind of programs that are tackling this, there's one really, really excellent example I'm going to give you, which is Culture Reframed, an NGO that's based, its secretariat is in Boston, but it's an international um, NGO where it's run by a great, great feminist campaigner, one of, I think, the world, the world's leading experts in anti-porn work from a human rights perspective, from, if you like, a pro-sex mm -hmm. perspective, as opposed to a moralistic, religious perspective. Now, Gail Dines set up Culture Reframed after a long time working in academia and looking at the power of imagery and how the porn trade makes its money and how that money mm -hmm. then translates into pushing technology, driving technology, and why it's ended up on the cell phones of our 10-year-olds, mm -hmm. as, well as, <clears throat> as well as being normalized to the point of where we have Pimp and Hobals, we have Pimp of the Year awards. You know, we've had, I mean, last time I was in, in Nevada, it was to attend the um, the the porn awards, the the annual oh, porn. Oh yeah, awards. didn't win anything though, Chris. But hey, no. <laughs> but you know, <clears throat> clearly I was I was reporting on it, and you know that that's the normalisation of porn. Now, what Gail Dines and her crew at Culture Reframe does is that she has the conversations with parents. So the parents are the ones, or the, their guardians, whoever they are, but the parents are the ones that are going to have to talk to their kids about this. My God, you know, I don't have kids, but there are plenty of young people in my life. I wouldn't know where to start. It's a tricky conversation. And the last thing that we want to do is put kids off 
exploring their own bodies, exploring their sexual responses, exploring sexual pleasure for themselves, thinking about sex as a nice thing mm -hmm. that clearly when they get older and it's the age of consent and it's a, a mutual yeah. kind of arrangement, that they're not, that we haven't screwed them up. We haven't gone too far in stigmatizing what they are exploring, but that we put the stigma and we problematize the pornography and the adults that want to exploit them. We put the stigma firmly on the exploiters and on the porn industry and not on our kids. And it's a tricky thing to do, but from what I'm seeing, from what Gail's done, she's having these conversations with parents of preteens and she's having them with young teens. And I think it's really done something great for these parents who didn't know how the hell to do it. Yeah, no, I'll definitely check into that. And, and yeah, like I, so here's what I've been doing lately. So my son's 12, starting to get a little sex education in school. We watch a lot of like shows and TV together and stuff, mainly like Marvel and things, but he's, uh, you know, he's been watching some other stuff with us, like not too grown up, but stuff that he might be interested in and everything. So something I've been trying to do since he's 12, he'll be 13 in a few months is like i've always been like the type where i'll like grab the remote and fast forward like any type of sex scene you know whatever and finally yep. i sat him down and had a talk i'm just like listen i'm gonna stop doing that and just so you know i'm 36 and it's still weird for me when i sit in a movie with my mom and that's on the screen i'm like it's just a parent kid thing you know whatever but i don't want i don't want to give him the wrong message like oh this is bad this is something you know whatever but right. But on the topic of porn, something I've noticed, and here's the only times I still fast forward, is there, and, and we live in a very sexualized society, there's sometimes where it's too much. I'm like, that scene was way too long, didn't add anything to the story. You know what yeah. I mean? Just because, yeah, yeah. And, and those are the ones where I'm like, all right, that's enough, you know, <laughs> just, just, you know, right. whatever. I, and I've actually heard, I've actually heard more of my adult friends you know, even sexual people who are like, it's in, in this show, it's like too much. Right. right. Um, but here's, so here's something. And like, I, I, on, we might have to do a part two, cause I think I could talk to you about this forever. So the topic, <laughs> the topic of porn and sex work and all that. So as I mentioned a little bit earlier, I've been talking a lot with my friends here in Vegas. I have friends who have stripped. I've had friends who uh, do, uh, like before OnlyFans popped off, they were doing like photography and, oh. you know, and stuff like that, you know, um, all this stuff, right? So yes, I, I've looked at the research and I understand like, you know, porn, right? Like uh, it's, it's bad for like young men. It gives this like kind of false idea of what sex is and, you know, and some of it is like, you know, uh, uh, violent and all these other things, right? Yeah. And then, and then, you know, there's been multiple stories lately about Pornhub, uh, having to crack down or, you know, crack down because some of these young girls are being sex trafficked and then they're being recorded, all this. But anyways, here's the question I have. You talk about it in the book. I've read other stuff on it, but I'm trying to understand. So since you're here, I want to understand. So I'm very, you know, liberal, progressive. And part of what I think about feminism is women making their own choice, right? Yeah. Like one of the greatest things to happen was we're, we started to normalize women going out into the workforce, getting a job, doing whatever they want, right? And one of the issues is, you know, men have seen ownership in the female body, you know? So I'm trying to understand, I'm trying to understand this concept of, you know, because in my brain, and I've seen like, you know, other guys be like, yeah, go for it, do OnlyFans, whatever. Because in my brain, it's like, okay, you are doing your body, your choice, you're making money yeah. how you want. And during the pandemic, especially, we've seen this explosion of people going on OnlyFans, right? So sure. there's this other argument that we're infantilizing women by saying, no, this is bad. So that's that's where I'm at. I've talked with a lot of people and I'm un and I see more people actually agree with you. And I, I'm it's hard for me to reconcile those two things. So you're the expert. Lay it on me because <laughs> I want to understand. Well, well, look, you know, I haven't been in prostitution, but I have you know suffered uh, sexual uh, exploitation. Um, uh, it's, it's a spectrum, I would argue. No one experiences the same. But I've spent decades talking to women who've who've left prostitution, who've escaped the sex trade, women who have been actually trafficked across borders, women in high class 
um, prostitution, women in, on the street, uh, in all kinds of scenarios. And, you know, th this is something that I've been looking at for a long time, but in particular the last couple of decades. And I wrote a book, The Pimping of Prostitution, on uh, the global sex trade. And I looked at the arguments in detail that are used by the pro-prostitution activists, the pro-sex work lobby, um, and, and found those that we see on our TV screens and on you know, here on our radios and on podcasts are not representative of the vast, vast majority of prostituted women. Now that doesn't mean to say that their experiences aren't valid and that they're theirs, of course they are. And I'm not in the business of telling women they don't have the right to choose what to do with their own bodies. But I am in the business of telling men that if they pay for sex with a woman who clearly doesn't want sex with him, because otherwise, why would the cash be involved? He is an abuser. He is on the spectrum of a sexual violator. He needs to understand that that woman doesn't want to be there, that sex is a two way street that he is doing things to her probably or possibly because his girlfriend doesn't want him to do that. So why is there another woman who he can impose that upon? Mm -hmm. Why is it that men think, I mean, the Johns and not all men clearly because Johns are in a minority, different, you know, kind of percentages wherever we go in different countries, but mm -hmm. Johns are in a minority and they I've interviewed a lot of Johns in a lot of different settings, and they seem to have this idea that if they pay for sexual services, they can get what they want. They can ask what they want. Many of them tell me that they pay the woman to leave afterwards and not speak to him. I mean, that's one of the kind of very common jokes that go around the kind of John community, you know, on sites like Pontonet. And what it does is it gives men a sense that women are there for them when they want at their convenience. But the effect it has on women is profound. Now, if you have a woman who's paying, for example, um, for her higher education, she might be at the University of Nevada doing uh, her doctoral thesis on sex work. Mm -hmm. She might put in a few shifts at one of Dennis Hoff's brothels in order to do her research, interview the women and also turn a few tricks for a bit of extra cash. Well, I would call her a tourist. I would say that she is dipping in and out of the sex trade in a way that most women don't have the opportunity to do. And that yes, she may be making a choice and she's making a choice in very different circumstances to the women who have no other choice. Now, I suppose if we get into semantics here, the way that we measure whether somebody is doing something of their free choice, is that there are alternatives. Mm. So if I say to you, I'm a journalist, Chris, and this is something I actively and happily chose. And I tell you that I had thought about being a researcher. I had worked in all kinds of other settings. Clearly I haven't been coerced into journalism. Mm -hmm. And also if I decide to leave journalism, I don't need an exit strategy with psychological um, supported mm. attached to that in order to get out right so so when it when i hear the word choice i think who has the choice do these women have a choice to do something else because when i ask men if they would rather work a shift in mcdonald's or take it up the ass from a stranger who they don't feel any sexual desire for yeah. and who they don't know when he last had a shower they choose the shift in mcdonald's they do Mm -hmm. and 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 why why else you know how else can we explain it except for to say that the johns have the most choice in the prostitution contract exchange mm -hmm. and the women have the least choice so yeah that's so that's kind of what i've been hearing i actually talked with a friend who's been uh in in sex work for a while and like i you know i've been trying to educate myself and have conversations and you know i'm just always curious that's why i like reading all these books and stuff and and yeah like from my perspective it was just like her she's just like i want to do this this is what i'm doing you know what i mean but she's you know not only did i learn a bit more about her and you know similar to what you're saying but all the other women she's talked to who are you know doing this and and that lack 
of choice. So I guess my main question is, because I try to play out conversations and scenarios in my head, right? Mm. And I, I think we also have to include, you know, there are there are women who hop on OnlyFans, just pictures. There's no male and female interaction, you know, all that. So with that and playing out some conversations, are there in, in your experience or in your opinion, are there any women that are just like, this is 1000% my choice. I am not experiencing psychological harm. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. when I play out that conversation, it almost feels like, like if it was me in that scenario, if I, if I put myself in that scenario, I'd be like, wait, is Julie gaslighting me? Am I, you know what I mean? So, yeah. so help me understand that perspective. Yeah. Uh, of course that that woman exists and I have yet to meet her but that's okay because I have yet to meet people with all variety of, of, of experiences I met a man um, in London where I live in the UK um, a black man who was black British and of, of African Caribbean descent who was in a conversation in a local political group about racism Mm -hmm. and about hate crime and about legislation and he was getting very angry and he said listen I'm a black man in my 30s and I have never experienced racism from white people growing up or as an adult so why the hell do we need to introduce this legislation and another person of color said to him good for you I'm delighted to hear that you've had good experiences and that this hasn't happened to you you are in the minority, a tiny minority. We don't legislate for the tiny minority, okay? We legislate for the more typical example of, you know, how somebody's life is going to be affected by racism. And it's the only way I can think to describe it. So I haven't met the woman who is the, I suppose the, the, the cliched phrase is the happy hooker. Mm -hmm. I've met many women who tell me that they that they are and I don't I'm not accusing them of false consciousness and I'm not gaslighting these women their experiences are their own and I can't possibly be in their heads what I do know though is that when I've interviewed women who tell me hey I'm putting my child through private school I've never been raped my clients all smell delightful and they treat me like a lady. They bring me flowers. I quite enjoy the sex. It's not as you think it is. And I'll get out as soon as I can when I've made enough money. And it's been great. I earn $250 an hour as opposed to $15 you know, dollars cleaning somebody's house. Okay, that's great. But when I speak to women who've got out of the sex trade further down the line, mm -hmm. Every single one of them has told me how she held herself together during that time in prostitution. Mm. Every single one has told me how she had to be in a space where she split almost from her consciousness, mm -hmm. became a different person and just hung on in there. Well, do you know what? Those women are strong and they are, like you say about your mum, they're kick-ass, yeah. right? We do not underestimate women that go through prostitution, that hold it together, that save the money, that get out and that survive. But my God, are they rare. So what I would say is instead of actually looking at the woman and her choices and her good experiences in prostitution, which it becomes a smokescreen for the industry, it becomes a smokescreen for what we really should be talking about. Mm. Men's choices, men's abuse, men's experiences. Why are punters, Johns, uh, as you call them in North America, I get it, but we call them punters. There are many words for them, some of which I'm not going to repeat on your podcast. <laughs> but why is it these men are on these forums? And I've spent a lot of time looking at those forums and talking to the men direct in detail. They're talking about, these are white guys I'm talking about here. They're talking about, hey, you know, I want an Asian babe because they do what you want. They swallow mm. your thumb. You know, I want an African woman because she never wears out. She can take it, you know, all night, all day. You know, I want a Chinese woman because you know, all these racialized stereotypes that are rooted in a kind of racist, colonialist misogyny that is so insidious 
and that gives men permission to look at women as though they're in some kind of, you know, burger joint or sweet shop, you know, candy store, choosing what they want, who they want. The attitudes they have about the women, they're talking about how he was fucking her doggy style and she was crying and saying, no, no, no. But that was all part of her getting turned on. These men tell themselves that the women have orgasms and that they enjoy the sex. When you interview the women and you tell them what the Johns are saying, they laugh. Even the women I've interviewed in Nevada brothels that are actually selling sex as I speak to them. Yeah. I mean, not actually, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> at the time, but are actually in those brothels. You know, and I've and I look, I listen carefully to what women tell me, and I never tell them that they are giving me a false response. I never question. Uh, then when they say I've never been raped I love my work I just listen to what the women say and I don't know if you recalled a bit in my book where I spoke about going to the Nevada brothels to do mm -hmm. research and I spoke to a woman there and clearly she'd been briefed by Dennis Hoff who thankfully is now dead terrible terrible man monster of a man and he had said yeah Julie you can interview the girls there were always girls, never women. And they called him daddy. They were required to call him daddy. Mm. And he said, I've got some girls for you. And here's one. And let, let's call her Annie. Um, and there was pornography of Annie on her own bedroom wall. Because these women are prostituted in one room. They live in one room. Mm -hmm. They exist in one room for months on end. They can't go out without permission from an assistant pimp because they don't want the women to go into town in case they pick up an STI from consensual sex with men. And then, you know, the Johns might get infected, which is bad for business. The women have, the women have weekly blood tests as though they're some kind of livestock to see if they're riddled with disease, as one of the assistant pimps told me, but the men do not. And of course, nobody enforces condom use of the men. It's all down to the women. Anyway, so I'm talking to Annie and thinking about how she must feel having pornography of herself played out on the wall in her bedroom. And she tells me how much she loves her work and what a great brothel it is and how she loves the other girls. They all get on really well. The Johns are all lovely. And as I'm preparing to leave, I say, gosh, your room doesn't have any personal effects. You know, it has no photographs. It has no kind of, you know, I don't know about you, Chris, but in my room, there's kind of like, you know, jeans over the chair. There's some yeah. paper on another one. There's, you know, my laptop and books on the floor. And uh, I thought it looks very sterile. And she kind of took a minute and looked at me. And then she opened the drawer of her bedside table and took out a framed photograph of a beautiful little girl and showed it to me whilst holding on to it and said, this is my daughter. Mm. But I keep this photograph hidden because I don't want those dirty bastards with their spermy hands touching her. Mm. And that told me everything that I kind of had feared for that woman, mm -hmm. that it's a veneer that she has to put on that act, that she understands these men are harmful to vulnerable females like her daughter. Mm -hmm. And that this is something she's doing either for survival or because no other choices are open to her. Yeah, no, and uh, and excuse my language, Julie, but you just blew my fucking mind. Like that, now it makes more sense, especially with the, uh, uh, the black man. Like I'm, like I'm half black and I've been looking at all these, you know, racial conversations and stuff like that. So if I'm understanding you correctly, it's, it's kind of like, uh, you know, just because a minority doesn't experience this, the, the majority, right? And, and right. yeah, with what you just said, that's something I've been thinking about a lot lately. Like my background, I'm a big psychology nerd and everything like that. And like you said, like it, you can't tell somebody what their inner experience is. Right. But, but the thing is like what I'm always asking myself, like my girlfriend, we've been having these conversations. She'll send me people on TikTok. Here's actually a good story. So she'll send me people on TikTok, you know, and people who work on OnlyFans and stuff. And I'm always asking myself, like, are you lying to yourself? Right? Like, how would I know if you're lying to yourself? Because uh, for example, right before we did this podcast, I wrote an article and I was talking about cognitive dissonance. We have to lie to ourselves. Self-deception is a huge thing. But anyway, yeah, sure. yeah. absolutely. <laughs> you know, girls, 
girls that grow up under patriarchy, we lie to ourselves all the time. Heterosexual women lie to themselves all the time. You know, it, it, it's uh, women with sons lie to themselves all the time because we have to keep sane. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. And that's sometimes it's the only way to survive this. But my girlfriend showed me this one video of this of this uh, this woman who's been in sex work for years. And she's talking about, you know, uh, uh, you know, the difference between destigmatization and normalization. She talks about how she's been in all realms of sex work from, you know, being a sugar baby to a prostitute to now doing OnlyFans. And she acknowledges the the all the women who have bad experiences. So we need to be having those conversations. But she's one of those people where I think it would be hard to have a conversation because she'd say this is all my choice right my right. girlfriend was like remember what this girl said i'm like okay and then she has me switch to the next uh the next tiktok from this same same exact woman and she's celebrating seven months clean from heroin Right? right. So I'm a recovering drug addict. I got sober in 2012 and immediately I'm like I'm like I can't say that anything I did during my drug addiction was my choice because everything <laughs> everything revolved around my addiction and right. that's something I've seen you know with people here in Las Vegas too uh, being somebody who's been so who's sober I've worked in treatment I know how many women have had to sell their body to feed their addiction too so so yeah a lot of this a lot of this is it's clicking now Julie but I don't I don't have much time with you and I have to touch on this. Um, and yeah, so hopefully we can condense it. But anyways, your book was uh, endorsed by J.K. Rowling. All right. And <laughs> like I this whole the whole conversation around uh, the trans debates and everything, I find it interesting. I think it's really nuanced. And Julie, I read I read J.K. Rowling's entire that long ass thing that she wrote. Yeah. And I, I read it and I was like, this isn't that bad. <laughs> like, you know, uh, I'm not, you know, obviously I'm not a trans person. So, you know, but I looked at, it, I'm like, this seems nuanced. And when I read your book and you talk about, you know, the, the trans issues and stuff, you, I, I do feel like the words like transphobic get thrown around like all willy nilly and stuff. But anyways, um, yeah, I watch you on Twitter. You get in some debates about some of these things and everything. So what I'm trying to understand uh, like I read uh, Helen Joyce's new book. I've read Abigail Schreier's new book. I, I, as a parent, I happen to think that Abigail Schreier's book was fantastic. Uh, you know, like, I'm like, hey, we need to have these conversations. You know what I mean? Like if there was a spike in adolescent suicide rates, we wouldn't just be like, whoa, 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 don't talk about that. Like we need, so, but anyways, uh, the question, the last question I have for you, help me understand like how, how does the, the trans conversation, what I keep hearing from people like yourself and Helen Joyce is, it's, it affects women's rights. That's where I don't understand because I think of it, like my whole thing is like, you know, I'm an atheist, right? But if you're religious, I don't care as long as you're not hurting anybody. So with the trans conversation, I'm like, if you're doing your thing, as long as you're not hurting anybody. So can you help me understand how does this affect women's rights? Like what, what are women losing in this trans conversation? And since we're wrapping this up, is there like a, a, some kind of middle ground, a compromise where, because like I said, I don't think you're transphobic. <laughs> like, so so what, where's that middle ground? So hopefully we can, we can cover that. <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah. Um, I mean, how cool is it, though, to get a cover endorsement from J.K. Rowling? I mean, that's pretty cool. Pretty cool. She's got a whole amusement park from her book. <laughs> it's, it's, you know. but, and, and also Martina Navratilova, who's one of my heroes. Yeah. Look, you know, the, the trans issue. OK, for, to take your second question first. Yes, of course, we can resolve this. And the reason why I know this is. So I'm 59 years old. I came out as a lesbian when I was 15. I started going to clubs with, you know, gay male friends that worked in the hair salon with me when I was sweeping up at the weekend. And they took me out to the gay clubs. And in those days, gay clubs were gay clubs, right? It was kind of, we had nowhere else to go, right? Mm -hmm. We didn't go to straight clubs and straight people didn't come to ours. So it was as gay as gay can be, right? Yeah. And the lesbians... They were so butch, you, they could have kick-started their own vibrators. You know, they were like, really, th there was some serious camp going on there as well. And what was really fantastic about that community, and it was mainly working class. I'm from a very working class background in the northeast of England, as you look on in my book. And so it was very working class, rough and ready, as we say. 
And amongst us were other people on the margins of society. So that meant that there were trans people who referred to themselves as transsexual at the time or or transvestites. It, it was it was not politicized. Um, and nor was there a pretense that this was about changing, uh, you know, that that somehow um, gender was a, an, an innate characteristic. It was perfectly well understood that there were, of course, some men that wished to live as women and that certain procedures needed to be gone through before that was going to be viable. But there were also lots of men who just wanted to dress and, and be drag queens and who wanted mm -hmm. to dress up. Uh, at weekends and experiment with all that stuff and you know what we were great friends they looked after the lesbians they looked after us young women because we were vulnerable to the fascist groups and the, the other thugs that came into the clubs to do a bit of queer bashing mm -hmm. um, and gay men often weren't that interested some of them were but some of them really didn't protect us and so we forged alliances with the loveliest of gender non-conforming people because that's what we were too mm -hmm. every lesbian and every feminist on the planet refuses to conform to gender rules by the very you know belief system we have if we're feminists and saying we want to shake off the sexist stereotypes or by being a lesbian and saying we don't want to have sex or babies with men so so that was all great and to fast forward, and no one, no one gave a damn if we saw trans people in our toilets because they were just there putting on their makeup, spraying their hair um, and asking if somebody would help them apply their false eyelashes. Right. That's what we all did together. Mm -hmm. Then fast forward to now. All was fine. Trans people needed legal recognition because, as my transgender friend Claudia says, who transitioned in the 1980s um, and who has since regretted it, but lives as a woman and, you know, was going through airports. She didn't she couldn't have Mr. and her original name on a passport when Claudia looks the way she does and lives as a woman. So that's just one example of why trans people needed to be protected in law and have their sex markers changed on, on legal documents. Okay, the problem happened when our idiotic Tory government decided that the first thing that they would task a minister for women with, because it was free and it was easy and it would get lots of claps, was to say, let's introduce self-identification for trans people. Let's not insist that they go through any medical process mm. at all, or sit before a board, which I understand would be a pain in the ass if you're a trans person needing to convince yeah. someone you want to have opposite sex. Of course it is. But let's not have any scrutiny at all. And let's just have a free for all. Now, even that wouldn't be so difficult and dangerous were it simply that men, because it usually is men and certainly was at the time that these proposed changes came through, were declaring themselves as women. I don't care. Who declares themselves as what, right? Do what, do what you like, call yourself what you like, dress how you want, please, I'm a feminist, I endorse that. The problem came when, in order to ensure that men who wish to live legally as women, but without any process, demanded use of our single sex spaces, refuges, mm -hmm. shelters, rape crisis centers, hospital wings, prison wings, sports facilities, because we have to safeguard against sexual violence, not because all men are rapists, but because enough men do sexually mm. in order for us to have built these services from scratch, then we couldn't possibly allow that to happen. We offered to help trans women build their own shelters, build their own rape crisis centers, because we'd done it from scratch and with no funding. Yeah. So we said to our trans sisters, we'll help you do it. But what we can't do is say that you can legally just come into ours because all kinds of opportunistic men will do that. We've seen it in Vancouver where just blokes, just ordinary men oh, go into Jessica, Yanni, even stuff. 
And they just sat there with beards and penises and, you know, just not even making an effort to pretend that they live as women. And it, it, it what happens is it chases all the vulnerable women out of that service. Mm. But what we said is we'll help you build these spaces because we've done it ourselves and we've got loads of expertise and we'll support you doing it because trans women do need protection from male violence. They don't need protection from feminists. They need protection from male violence notice. Mm -hmm. And so the final thing I'll say about it is what made it terribly dangerous and toxic and why those of us that campaigned to end male violence had to get involved is because in order for those men who are identifying as women and the opportunistic men that just want to assault women and just really hate us for having our own spaces, which clearly most trans women don't, but there are enough men that do, as I say, that will jump on that bandwagon. In order to access those spaces and it not be inconvenient for them having to answer loads of questions, they, the trans activists, as opposed to trans people who just want to get on with their lives, the trans activists, including mm. the organisation Stonewall in the UK, campaigned to end our sex-based rights that we fought for decades for, 100 yeah. years ago, campaigned to overturn sex exemptions with gender expression, which meant we would lose every single bit, and I do not exaggerate, of legislation that protects us as women and girls from male violence. We would lose that and gender expression would trump it. So the reason why for feminists like me, and there are plenty of women kicking off about this that aren't feminists actually, that don't like lesbians, don't like gay men, don't like trans people. Some of them even support Trump. They're not feminists, they're not on our side and we don't work with them. But why feminists on the left who campaign to end male violence are so angry about self-identification and the way that the conversation's going, which is any man can identify as a woman and we ask no questions in our bathrooms or in our prisons, is abhorrent. There have been women who've been raped by convicted sex offenders who are male bodied, who take on the identity of woman and they're asked no further questions. So we can't have it. So we stand by trans people. We stand against the abuse, marginalization and human rights violations of trans people, but we cannot lose our sex based rights as women in order to appease a tiny minority for whom there should be a third way. Yeah, uh, that all that makes so much more sense, and I and I get it, and and I I do believe you that you think that, like there there's this way to work together, and I wish I wish we had more time, Julie. We might have to do a part two sometimes because, because yeah yeah because I now that my wheels are turning, especially with like uh, shelters for women, because I know some women who run shelters for women, and my wheels are turning, and I've worked yeah. So anyway anyway, Julie, you. You are amazing. And yeah, I love the book. I hope everybody gets it. I learned a lot. I learned even more from this conversation. So uh, I'm going to link the book down below. Uh, it's going to be released in more countries. But for all the work you're doing, and you've been talking a lot and doing a lot of stuff, I follow you on Twitter. Is that the best place? Or where can people keep up with your work and what you're doing? Yeah, Twitter. Um bindle b-i-n-d-e-l-j so at bindle j i do have a website which i barely ever look at but it's there it's the, <laughs> i think it's the juliebindle.com not because i think i'm the julie bindle but because the other domain was already taken yeah so, yeah that that's a great and my website is on there i'd love to hear from from people i'd love to talk to you again chris and by the way complete and utter congratulations for getting through your hellish addiction situation oh, and coming out you. the end of that you know yeah. that that must be pretty tough so good for you yeah no we're, all, we're both a couple of fighters and that's just what we do <laughs> so thank yeah. you so much julie and yeah hopefully we'll be talking again soon i'd love to chris